Could Ryan or Bijal, could you comment about the T cell, uh, ALL, and some of the subcategories there, and your sense of you know, the initial assessment of those patients? Uh, sure. I think um, there are certainly some uh, molecular factors that are perhaps involved in prognosticating uh, with T cell ALL. Uh, the, the French group has looked at this and have identified a, a four gene panel that involves uh, either the presence or absence of mutations at these different genes. It's a little cumbersome uh, from a clinical perspective because not a lot of labs are able to routinely test for these. Um, so it's not clear to me how routinely utilize, you know, routine it is to be able to use in clinical practice, but it may be something as our technologies improve that these could be utilized further. Um, unlike the pH-like story, which is definitely an evolving and interesting one, but is really more a phenomenon of B-cell ALL, we're still a little bit behind the curve in terms of understanding some of the uh, really important biologic risk uh, factors in T-cell ALL, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I'd agree. Uh, I, I, I will push back a little. Uh, we, we, I do think it's uh, along the same lines uh, as, as with BALL to try and pick up on those notch, those RAS, the, the P10 uh, uh, mutations. I, I, I do think that, uh, I, I think it was the GMAL experience that, that had demonstrated that uh, MRD alone, you know, while it does predict for the risk of relapse, if you include this genetic uh, risk assessment, you get a, a more broader sense of, of who's likely to fare poorly. Uh, and so we do try to build both MRD and genomics into the, the risk stratification for all the reasons I mentioned before. Stepping, taking a step back, um, at least anecdotally what we see is uh, a lot of these mutations tend to accumulate in this early T precursor subgroup. They tend to, they, they, we tend to see that particularly RAS mutations in that, uh, in that category of, of patients. Early T thus far has been defined by flow. And so we're looking principally for a CD4, CD8 negative population with a DIM CD5 and, and, and the presence of these myeloid antigens like CD33 and 34. And, and so this has been the, the tool that we use. Uh, and uh, we, we, again, are, are going to approach the early T precursor patients um, with uh, the same sort of very close observation that I would say we would do for a pH-like patient. This is the patient where I may be more apt to get an MRD estimate early, but also repeat it, for example, after consolidation. And it's probably worth noting that unlike BALL, this is a scenario where the immunophenotype up front can be particularly useful if you identify the early thymic precursor uh, phenotype, although there are some controversial data about how prognostic that is. And so Agreed. I think um, in COG studies that has been used in the past as one of the branch points for different uh, types of therapy in the adult medicine world, uh, we have not implemented different therapies, but I would agree with uh, closer monitoring for MRD because they may have a higher likelihood of failure. And slower clearance of MRD as well. Yeah. yeah, interesting. Some of those patients can have a FLT3 mutation. I mean, they can have some features that would suggest some myeloid uh, characteristics. Um, so I think it is, it is a challenging group. Um, what is your sense, Aaron, in those patients, the, the, early t the early thymic precursor patients, as to whether they have a poor prognosis or not? I think there's been some controversy about that. There have that. been some controversy. I think, you know, my read of the literature is that um, there are enough studies that have called into question um, whether this immunophenotype carries a high risk that um, I'm worried about it, and I'm worried about the lack of clearance of MRD. Um, which, as we're going to talk about, is uh, probably one of our, uh, our major goals with therapy for ALL. And so, um, as a transplanter, I need to make a decision, am I going to transplant this patient or not? And one of the major uh, criteria that I'm going to use is whether they achieve MRD negativity by some of the milestones that we can talk about. So I think that the ETP patients are at higher risk of failing those milestones. And so, you know, I, while as a transplanter I get every patient potentially ready for a transplant, I'm certainly looking real hard for a donor for an ETP patient. Just in case.